Welcome to Steve Reads Bible Stories. Reverend Steve Janes reads Bible stories while pointing out keys and principles on how to read the Bible. Hi, my name is Steve Janes, and this is the More Abundant Life Podcast. This is episode number 337. And it's a repeat of the very first podcast that I did over two years ago, which number was 201, The More Abundant Life. God bless you all in the wonderful name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And today I'm going to teach on the more abundant life. I guess I'd like to start with a story about when I first heard that term, the more abundant life. When I first heard John 10.10, because that's where we're going to start, John 10.10. I went into a fast food restaurant the month of April of that year, and I was sitting down, and this person came in and asked if they could sit down with me. And I said, sure, you know, have a seat. And he came and he had a seat. And we started talking. And he started asking me, you know, how are things going? And I remember saying, well, it's been a pretty tough winter, but I'm expecting this summer to be good. The spring has started here. I'm hoping to get some work and things would turn around. Now, I want to talk a little bit what happened just nine months before that meeting. Nine months before that meeting, my father died in a car accident. That was not a happy time for our family when my father passed on. Also, I started a painting contract in business that summer. And I was doing pretty well. I had a crew. We were painting houses all that summer. But when fall came, all the work stopped. House painting business was over. Fall was coming. Winter was the fall of that. I did everything I could to survive through that winter. I did all kinds of work. I unloaded trucks, went to manpower, did all kinds of things. But at the same time, I started reading blueprints. And I read blueprints all winter long and bid on all kinds of work. For the upcoming year, work that was becoming available. And so... April, when I was sitting in that fast food restaurant, I was thinking, well, things are about to turn around. Things are going to get better. And this man sat down with me, and he said, well, how are things going? And I said, well, they haven't been going very well, but I'm expecting them to start to get better. Spring is here. And he opened up his Bible, and he read it to me. He went to John 10.10, and it reads like this. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And he asked me, he says, wouldn't you like to have an abundant life? And I said, yes. What would would anyone say? You know what he said to me? That's not what it says. It says more abundant life. Jesus Christ came so that you could have life and have it more abundantly. Not just abundant more abundant. And I don't know if he read the first part of the verse to me or not, but I noticed the first part of the verse where it says, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I remember thinking, something has been doing that to me. Someone has been trying to steal from me, kill and to destroy my life. As I was working hard, to try to make something of myself. Something was was hurting me. Something I couldn't see. And here it says the thief is the one that was doing this. The thief. But the person that was talking to me that day at that fast food restaurant just concentrated on the last part of the verse. He kept saying, I am is talking about Jesus. Do you think that Jesus told the truth or a lie? And I'd say, well, I believe that Jesus would tell the truth. I didn't know a lot about the Bible at that time, almost none. I knew quite a bit about religion because I was raised in a Catholic church. And, but I did believe that Jesus Christ would tell the truth. I just had that feeling. Yeah, he wouldn't lie. Jesus Christ wouldn't lie. Well, he says, I am come that you might have life 
and that you might have it more abundantly. And he kept pounding that verse in my head for like a half hour. Just kept bringing it up. And every time I'd say something, yeah, but what about this? He'd go, did Jesus lie? I go, no, this is what it says. Jesus Christ came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. And he says, wouldn't you like to have a more abundant life? And I would always say, yeah, I'd love it. You know, where can I get it? And he goes, well, Jesus Christ came that you might have life and have it more abundant. Lee, it's even bigger, you know, more abundantly. And I thought, wow, I want that. And he invited me to a fellowship, a home fellowship, much like what we're doing here today. And I went to it, and I was tremendously blessed. And I was excited about the word and wanting to learn more about it because of what he was sharing and teaching. One of the things that I knew that I didn't want was religion. But I liked that they met in the home. I liked that they just sat in chairs and prayed, sitting in their chairs, no getting up and kneeling and all this stuff. And they presented the word. They just read it to me. I said, this is good. I'd like this. But something else happened at that time. I started to get all the work. I got busy. The phone calls started ringing. Had to put a crew together. Matter of fact, I had to put four crews together. I had an ad in the newspaper and I was painting houses, so I put a crew together to start painting houses. I got a contract with a, a building contractor that built all kinds of houses. So one after another, they were building houses and we were painting inside and outside. I got a condominium project. The whole bunch of buildings, inside and out. I bid on it, I got the job. Had to hire more people, had to find foremen. I made all my painters foremen. Because <laughs> those are the people that I knew. Then, one of the jobs I bid on was at Brunswick Naval Air Station, and I had 138 units to do all the painting of inside and out. And they were living quarters for people. So they were living in them. It was, the job was really just the doors and windows, inside and out. So I hired 12 people to do that job. And I was like running around crazy trying to keep all, everything going and driving my El Camino as fast as I could to <laughs> get jobs done, get over to this job, make sure this guy was going, had problems with foremen who said they would do the job, had one guy at Brunswick who just drove around in his car and yelled at the painters. And I says, the foremen that work for me are working foremen. They paint and then they keep the crew going while they're there at the job. They don't just ride around and look good. What was really going on, I was losing my shirt. I bid those jobs like I was one man with a small crew. This was big. The Navy station, that it kept me hours just doing the paperwork. Just the, the discrimination they forms they wanted you to fill out, all this stuff. It was just crazy. I was driving from Portland to Brunswick, going down Route 1 because 295 wasn't finished yet. And I was going through there and a Freeport policeman stopped me and they did a check on me. On the radio it came back that I was a good candidate for an habitual offender for speeding. I got a lot of speeding tickets. And so he arrested me. And I told him, I told him, I said, I am working here. I've got crews all over the place. There's a lot going on. He goes, hey, I'm arresting you. Wow. And he arrested me and th threw me in jail. And I said, it didn't say I was. It says I was a good candidate because I was getting a lot of speeding tickets. He didn't have to do that. Then the, that verse, you know, the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. I'm sitting in jail. Things were just getting out of hand with my business. Specters at the Navy job, our crew, I, I told them, you put the caulk in the windows, then paint it. They were tearing the caulk out of the windows because in their specs, you let that caulk dry before you paint it. I said, we don't have time to go back to those windows twice. They didn't care. They just tore it out. So I told the crew, I told the crew load everything up, we're out of here. And I just quit that project. I finished up the condominium that we were working on, 
And then I finished up the contractor that was building all the houses. I finished that one up, finished them all up, and just quit. Just stopped. It was, I just couldn't do it. I, and I knew that I was over my head and I was in debt. You could walk into any paint store at that time, me, because I had no credit problems, and buy all the paint I wanted, all the equipment I wanted. At the end of that summer, I was like $20,000 in debt, which was a lot of money in the 70s. And so I went and saw a friend of mine, and I said, John, I need a lawyer because I think I'm in big trouble. He goes, I got a good lawyer for you. And he also told me about these home fellowships that he was going to. Something else in the meantime, in August, I tried to find that guy that talked to me. I remember where his fellowship was. It was on Best Street, Best Street in Portland. Just a good name, Best, because he used to tell me all the time that I'm the best. He just met me that one time. Oh, there'd be messages on my answer machine. Steve, God bless you. You are God's best. And I'm like, I like this phone call. <laughs> this is a lot different than the other phone calls I was getting. But I went to his home and he wasn't there. Got me back in touch with people that were running home fellowships. And then after that, I've never stopped going back to those fellowships. I, I never will stop. I'm going to be doing this till the return. That The return is when Jesus Christ returns. I'm going to be doing this until then because it works. See, John 10.10, 10, Jesus Christ said, and he didn't lie, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That verse really did change my life. It really put, set me on a quest to learn and to know. I wanted to know how to tap in to the, for the resources of that, that more abundant life. I wanted that. I didn't want to have the thief bother me, but I wanted to have that more abundant life. So I started learning the keys and principles to understand how to tap in to that more abundant life. And that's why I run fellowships today. That's why podcast to let people know that this life is available. And it's available by knowing the scriptures. Jesus Christ came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Look at Romans chapter 8. I want to look at this more abundant life today. What is available? You find out what's available by going to God's word and reading what's available. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. What a great verse, huh? See, for those of us who love God, all things, that, I love that word all, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. And by the way, you're all called. God calls everybody. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him shall be saved. God calls everybody. You ran across me because God called you. It's that simple. For whom he did foreknow, and you can learn in God's word that God knew you before the foundations of the world, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God made it available when we get born again to be just sons of God, just like Jesus Christ. They don't teach you this in every church you go to, but God looks at all the born again believers just like Jesus Christ. Pretty cool. So, he was the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called, he called you. And whom he called, then he also justified. And I was taught one time that justified, you can look at that, just as though I've never sinned. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. And he did that too. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God is for you, 
Who can be against you? Well, the answer is nobody. You can have this giant list of all the people that don't like you, who are against you, businesses, people, organizations that don't like you, this big list. It doesn't matter, because on this side, God is for you. If God's for you, it doesn't matter that other list. So God is for us. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who could be against us? And the answer is nobody. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And that's what I was saying earlier. That word all is a big word. All He gives you all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Is it God that justifieth? I don't think so. Who is he that condemneth you? Is it Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again? Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. In other words, he's saying, hey, Cora's cool. Rose is cool. These people believe in me. They're all right. Mo, he's cool. Ken too. We're all cool. But we're, he makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Look at all the things. These are bad things. I mean, a tribulation, mental pressure. Oh, what am I going to do? Distress. I don't know where to go from here. Persecution. People saying bad things about you badly. Persecution. Famine. Get enough to eat. Naked. You know, that is. Or peril. You know, dangerous situations or sword. Someone would use a weapon to get rid of you. As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. I wonder where that's written. It's not written in God's word. Some poet probably did that. You are killed all the day long. You are counted as sheep for the slaughter. That's what someone wrote. But what does it say here? Nay. In all these things, and there's that word all again. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Jesus Christ came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. We are more than conquerors. Pretty great. Through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, we know what that means. Not one I odor a doubt. When you're fully persuaded, what are you? Fully persuaded persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principality nor powers nor things present nor things to come lots of things nor height nor death nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord nothing can separate us from the love of God nothing as soon as we want God, we can go, God. You don't even have to raise your hand. But you can just go, God, God. He's that close. God, I need a little help here. Give me a little help. So what? We're more than conquerors. That's a good way to live. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. We're going to read just one verse here that has so much about all in it. 2 Corinthians 9.8 and God is able to make all grace abound to you, that ye always, and always is almost like all, all grace abound towards you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every, and that's almost like all, good work. See, God is able to make all grace abound to you that you have all sufficiency in all things. You know what that means? You have what you need. All sufficiency. Whatever you need to do, whatever God places on your heart to do, you can do. You can do it. You can have all sufficiency in all things and abound to every, not just a couple, every good work. So what? this is what God's made available. The more abundant life, more than conquerors, all sufficiency in all things. That ought to be enough right there, huh? It's a good light, but there's more. Ephesians 3.20 Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly. That's a good word too, huh? Now unto him that is able to do exceeding, which is a lot, exceeding abundantly, above all that we may ask 
or think according to the power that works within us. Not too long ago, we got into teachings about asking. We ask for things. We ask God to help us with things. That's why I said God, because we need help. We need to know the score. We need to have, we need this abundant life that Jesus Christ came to make available. And it's available, so we say God. That's what makes the difference, God. According to the power that works within us. Pretty wonderful. So we got more abundant life, more than conquerors, sufficiency in all things, exceeding abundantly above all things. Let's go to uh, Philippians, Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all, there's that word all again, all your need according to his riches and glory. You know what that is? It, that word need, by the way, has no S at the end. Because God takes care of your need before you get to the S, before you get to the needs. Now, in life, sometimes we forget God and we start piling up needs. But Why? We do that, I don't know. We don't have to. We can go to God and get our need taken care of before it ever gets to needs. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That is pretty cool. How is this done? How does God do this? That was my question to that man that was sitting with me at that fast food. How? How is this done? How is it available? Well, what we've been reading are things that God says is available. How do we get this? Well, we get it by learning what the scriptures say. By learning what the scriptures say so that we can tap into these resources for the more abundant life. See, these Bibles are very valuable to us. You know, almost every family has Bibles. They're usually dust-covered. You heard the story but if you read it you can and learn how to read it you can tap into the resources for the more abundant life go to matthew first gospel matthew 22 and here's a key in how to learn about this matthew 22 29 is where i want to go jesus answered and said unto them you do err and that word er mean make mistakes, come up short, make a boo-boo. It says, and Jesus answered and said unto them, you do err. Err means to make a mistake, come up short, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Without knowing the scriptures, then you make mistakes in life, and you don't understand the power of God how God works, how God can do everything that we were just reading about, how can you, you can have all sufficiency in all things. you got to know the scriptures to tap into that. It's simple as that. Go to John chapter 5, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chapter 5, which is sort of the beginning of John, in verse 39. And once again, this is Jesus Christ speaking. And he says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. See, Jesus says, Search the scriptures. That is what we need to do to know the will of God. We need to f search the scriptures. What does the scriptures say? And when we know that, then we can learn the principles and the promises of God. And that's what we do at this fellowship. What I always want to do is teach principles and promises that can help you tap into the resources for the more abundant life. I do not want to teach any religious ceremonial stuff that doesn't help anybody i don't care if you kneel or if you don't kneel you know i don't care if you wash your pots or not i don't care what you look like don't care what you wear all i care is what does the word say i'm not really into religion don't like religion that summer after i sat with that man at that fast food restaurant and i was thinking about the things of god as i was trying to do my business 
I saw that there was this tent revival. Revival meeting here tonight. And I said, well, I'm going to go down there because I want to learn how to tap into the resources for the more abundant life. That's what I was thinking in my mind. So I drove down there with my El Camino and got down there. And there's lots of people there. And and they're doing stop music. They got music playing and everything. But then they, at some point they says, well, who wants to be delivered? And people lined up to be delivered. And so I got in line. But you know something? I didn't want to be delivered from anything in particular. I was healthy, so I didn't want to be delivered, but I wanted to know more. And so I'm walking in line, and he would find people, and he would smack them on the forehead like that and say whatever they said he said be gone from you they'd walk off and he came to me and i really didn't know what to say so i said drugs and alcohol because i was doing some of that but i wasn't you know against it or anything i mean you know what i mean i didn't really want to be delivered for i just wanted to know this and he goes like this drugs and alcohol be away from you and I walked out and I said, no wonder it's in a tent, it's a circus. That's exactly what I thought. So I knew what I didn't want. I didn't want the religion of kneeling and getting up and getting, you know, that crap. And I didn't want the circus stuff either. I wanted the stuff where they sat around in a circle in their living room and people taught you the word and people didn't go through gyrations or shows of any kind. They just said, this is what the word says. And then I could actually, instead of getting sore knees, I could go out and try it. You know, I could try praying this way and see what God would do for me. I could ask God for a parking place and get one. I like that. I didn't care for religion or circuses or shows. And I still don't. I want the word. I thought I'd share with you one principle, just one that you could utilize to tap the resources for the more abundant life. And that's in Matthew chapter 6, 25. And one of the reasons I'm going to this verse is because this is where I was at that day at that fast food restaurant. Even though I had hopes for something good to happen because the stuff I did through the winter, I was like this person here, okay? Therefore, I say unto you, Take no thought for your life. And that word thought is mental pressure. Anxiety. You're going, oh, how, what am I going to do? How am I going to make it through the day? How am I, where am I going to live? And then those were thoughts that I really had in my mind at that time. How am I going to make it? Shall we eat or what shall we drink? Nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. And you know what? God does take care of the birds. We see birds come here a lot because Rosa puts bird seed out. But we see them come around and uh, God takes care of them fine. When it's cold out, like in the blizzard, they're fine. I don't know how they are, but they are. The chickadees come in and out, and I'm like, wow, it's a a blizzard. But God set up a system to take care of the birds. He just did. The last part of that verse says, are ye not much better than they? Well, yeah, I'm better than a bird. But God has a system for the birds, and he has a system for us. Which of you, by taking thought, mental pressure, that's what that word thought means, can add one cubit to his stature. Who can grow a foot? Well, I tried. When I was in high school and I was playing basketball, I thought it'd be better if I was a little taller. Didn't work. (laughs) Nothing you can do. You're going to be the height you are. So you might as well like it. I like it now. And I could do some things that some big men couldn't do with the basketball. But there it is. Why take ye thought, mental pressure for raiment, for clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. The beautiful wildflowers that you can see in fields, they don't do nothing. They don't spin, toil, they just grow. Sometimes they grow despite of things. In our yard here, we went away a couple weeks and 
our lawn grew and all these wildflowers grew. And I said to Rosa, I said, Rosa, I think this looks pretty good. And we mowed around, and those wild, some of those wildflowers are still there because we mowed around them, around the mailbox and up front here and stuff. But it's so true. They grow, and they do nothing, and they look beautiful in verse 29. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Therefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith, or weak believing, or immature, I think is the best definition. Immature, you just haven't learned enough to believe. It says, therefore, take no thought, no mental pressure, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. And I want to just point this out. Jesus Christ came to, to Israel, to Judeans. At the time that Jesus Christ was speaking here, they were Judeans, and Gentiles was everybody else. A Gentile was everyone who wasn't part of the household of Israel. So what it's saying here, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek. That means everybody. That's what he's really saying. Everybody seeks this. Believer and unbeliever. Today. People who believe in God and people who don't believe God still care about where they live, how they get their food, what they're going to do. I mean, these things everyone cares about and everyone's thinking about. The difference is we do it differently. We trust God. We ask God for help. We believe that God will take care of us. We believe that God will show us how to get that more abundant life that Jesus Christ made available. So we don't have that mental pressure. We just trust in God. And it goes on to say, For after all these things does the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth what that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things things shall be added unto you. So what we have here is we have the principle and the promise. The principle is seek ye first the kingdom of God. The promise is you'll have it. All these things will be added to you. You're going to have everything you need. And once again, the word need is in the singular here. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow. And that doesn't mean you don't think about tomorrow. We got to plan tomorrow. We got to plan the things we're doing this week. That's not what it's saying. The word thought means mental pressure. So you just go, okay, well, we're going to make it through today, and tomorrow God will take care of us. Well, let's see what the whole verse says. You know something? The Bible can say it much better than I can. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought. For the things of itself. Sufficiency unto the day is the evil thereof. See, there is evil in each day because the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But we don't worry about that. We just take care of today and tomorrow we'll take care of tomorrow. Simple principle. Wonderful principle. Let's I'm gonna close in Colossians. Philippians Colossians chapter three. In this verse, in, in uh, Matthew, that was written to Israel. That's why I talked about the Gentiles and stuff. This verse is written directly to us, those that are born again. It says a very similar thing. It says, verse 1, And ye then, it should say, since ye, not if, but since ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. By doing that is how you get your needs met. God will take care of you. Seek in first the kingdom of God. That's the principle, that one principle that I, was, I wanted to share today. But in our fellowship, I like to teach principles every time I teach. I like to have the teaching be a teaching that you could utilize that very week. You could practice the principle and see the promise. Or sometimes remind us of it. But always 
so that we can tap in to the resources for the more abundant life. And like I said, stay away from all the religion. Stay away from all the show. Here's the promise. Here's the principle. There's another thing that God's Word has that's not in this teaching at all, but God has plenty of exhortation, he has encouragement for us also. So there's principles, promises, encouragement, full in God's Word. Dear God, we're just thankful and blessed that you are our God, that you love us, you'll take care of us, and we're just so thankful for you being our God, for giving us this word so that we can know you and know ourselves and know what we have, God. And God, I thank you for that we can, with all gusto, just endeavor for that more abundant life. And I thank you for that in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are a listener-supported podcast. I want to thank those who generously give so that we can keep the podcast available. The podcast is heard around the world for all those who would want to know how to accurately understand the Bible when they read. The episode is complete, so head over to stevejanes.com. While there, sign up for our newsletter. If you're interested in learning how to read the Bible, there's also an audio class and companion books available on How to Read the Bible for Understanding and Power. The website has audio teachings and biblical studies books all there to help you grow in God's grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Listen next week for another reading of God's wonderful, matchless Word.